We welcome you to our service today. We hope that you have had a wonderful Easter and the celebration meant quite a bit to you. We celebrated Easter last week when the sorrow of Good Friday turned into the joy of Easter Sunday morning. And that's a lot like life. In life, we're going to have trials. We're going to have troubles and sorrows. But Jesus says we're not alone. Our scripture today comes from 1 Peter, the first chapter, of verses 3 through 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into the living hope, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into the inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading kept in heaven for you who are being protected by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you have to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold, that though perishable is tested by fire, may be found to result in the praise and the glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. For you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. May God add his blessing to his holy word. In our scripture today, Peter begins the epistle by thanking God, thanking him for the mercy that he shown to us. Peter realizes that the mercy that we have seen is not something we generated, it's a gift from God. Upon pondering this, Charles Spurgeon said, his goodness to us begins with mercy. No other attribute of God could have helped us had mercy been refused. Justice condemns us. Holiness frowns upon us. Power crushes us. Truth confirms the threatening of the law and wrath fulfills it. It is from mercy, the mercy of God, that our hope begins. He has certainly shown mercy to each of us. Our hope in the Lord begins with the fact that Jesus defeated death. He overcame the grave and now he is at the right hand of God, interceding for us with his Father. That validates his promise to us that one day we are going to be with him in heaven. We're going to know all the joys of heaven. Hope as this world knows it and the things that we think we long for to satisfy us are basically just wishful thinking. Those thoughts, those hopes, they'll end at the grave one day. Our Christian hope is based on Jesus Christ, who overcame death and who promised us an eternal home in heaven. And we will overcome death as too as well because we believe in him. This promise is secure so secure that we can bet our lives on it, and we who are Christians do. Peter tells us that what we've been given is a living hope. It's an inheritance that's incorruptible. It came from Jesus Christ, so it is undefiled. It will not fade away. It will not be taken from us. It's not limited, and it's not temporary. The hope of the rich can fade with a bad investment. Their health can fade and their riches do them no good. The quest for power can change with a change of management or nationally with a change of an election result. There is only one thing in this life that we cannot be afraid of or worried about, and that is our security in Jesus Christ. It's the only eternal security that we can rest assured of. We will not be turned away if we trust in him. People in this world put their hope in others who die. 
They chase after things that can be destroyed or decay or deteriorate. Our faith in Christ is incorruptible. As I said, it's undefiled. And it's reserved in hell for us in heaven. Empires have been defeated. Dynasties have fallen because of internal corruption. But our inheritance of the saints is protected for, by God for you in heaven. And it will not pass away. You have the ability to put it down and walk away from it. And in the past few years, many have. It's unfortunate, but only 37% of the people who live in this country now call themselves a practicing Christian. That's way down from the numbers just a decade ago. But for those who choose to make Jesus Christ their Lord, our faith is secure. It will not fail. We will see our Lord. Why does God give to us this hope? Because he knows that in this world that we live in, we're going to need it. Having our hope in Christ doesn't mean that we're not going to face trials or troubles, but it does mean that we won't face them alone. It means that we will have the strength from God to handle them differently than non-believers. For Christians, times of sorrow come, but they only come to visit. They don't move in with us. We have the hope that Jesus will take us from that. And one day, even if it's in heaven, we will have our peace. We can look to God to restore our joy. For the unbeliever, gladness only comes occasionally. And they expect sorrow and disappointment in this world. That's because they're not connected to the source of joy, the Holy Spirit, who wants to bring joy into your life and show you a life that will others want to imitate. None of us go through life without trials. As Paul wrote in Romans 8, 35, who shall separate you from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, in these things we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. We're told to expect difficulty in this life, but we're promised the help that we can deal with it as well. So why is it that the Lord grows our faith? He understands it himself. He knows what we face in this world. He was born into poverty in a stable where they wrapped him in rags to keep him warm. He dealt with life as we do. He ran a carpenter shop in Nazareth. He paid bills and he met deadlines and he did the things that most of us have to do. He put together in Galilee a group of followers who even though they saw him do miracles and heard him teach, didn't fully understand all that he was trying to teach them till he had been resurrected. They were human beings. They argued among themselves about which one would be the greatest in the kingdom. One of them even stole from him and wound up betraying him. He lived with a family growing up that was embarrassed by his teaching and told him, why don't you take your apostles and leave and go so you don't embarrass the family. For the good that he did in this world, the religious leaders did not commend him. They were jealous of him. And they had him put to death, the most horrible of deaths, death on a cross. So knowing these challenges, knowing what he had faced himself, he gave to us the hope and the faith to deal with life. Faith is a gift, but as Charles Surgeon said, let's not be mistaken, God never gave us faith to play with. Faith is a sword. It was never made to be exhibited on a parade ground. It was made to cut and to wound and to slay. And whoever has faith may expect between here and heaven 
to learn what a battle means. God has made nothing in vain. He especially made nothing in the spiritual kingdom in vain. He made faith that it is to be used with the utmost and exercised to the full. We must expect trials and days are the elements of faith. Faith without trials is like a diamond that's been uncut. It's greatest brilliance never seen. It's like a fish that's out of water or a bird that doesn't have air. We must believe that our faith will be tested and that we will stand because we don't stand alone. We have the power of God. Why does God allow this in our lives? He fully knows how much grief and how severe the trial that we can face is. But most of us don't. Until we've been through a time of testing, we don't know what kind of faith we have. We don't know what we can endure. And we don't know the strength and the help of God. God allows us to be tested so that we're able to endure more and that we're able to have a greater vision of his power in our life, which gives us the hope that we live in. If we're to believe that we're faithful Christians, it won't be proved by an unchallenged life in this world. We are proved as faithful when we endure the challenges and we still trust and glorify God. To trust God in the middle of life struggles brings glory to Him, and that's what we're to be about. We see His faithfulness, and He will bring honor to us because we were faithful. No one wants to go through difficult periods in life, yet none of us escape them. Peter tells us here that our faith is more precious than gold. And gold is much more valuable once it's been put into the fire and the impurities that are in it burned away. The same is true with our faith. It's stronger once it's been tested. If I had previewed today's sermon and told you that I was going to be speaking about the blessings of trials and persecution, I'm sure that my audience would be very small. No one wants to hear about that. But it's impossible to grow and strengthen your faith without it being tested, without you seeing the afflictions of this world that come. They make us stronger. They make us better. Or we become bitter. The choice is ours. God gives us the strength. What will these trials and troubles, what will dealing with them bring into our life? Peter tells us in verse 7 of this epistle that the Lord will praise our faithfulness when we arrive in heaven. The trials that we have endured do not go unnoticed by God. Peter says we will be honored there as well. Possibly the crowns that are spoken of of being distributed at the judgment seat of Christ will be there when he recognizes us as remaining faithful and trusting Him during the difficult days of our life. Peter also mentions glory to those who have endured those sufferings and trials in the world and who have remained faithful to God. Sometimes in the midst of the battle, we think we're alone. We think we're fighting it all by ourselves, but we're not. God is there. He knows what we're going through. And he supplies to us through the strength of the Holy Spirit all we need to deal with it. Our difficulties, our trials, they're not unnoticed by God. He knows every moment of your life and he's with you. And although we have not seen Christ in the flesh, we have the promise of his salvation and eternity with him. Our faith has led us to know that that promise that he has made to us is real. And yet, when we face those trials, we don't face them alone. But God comes to be with us, to help us, and to strengthen us. In this epistle, Peter writes the letter to us, 
And he tells us that we're pilgrims in this land. And he's true. Our home is in heaven. And our soul longs for us to be there one day. It's easy to get attached to the things of this world, but they are only temporary. For one day God will call us to the place that he has prepared for us for all eternity. Our Lord came here into this world to deal with the same troubles that we do and to assure us that one day all of these trials will end and we'll be with him in heaven. And while he was here, he faced the one thing that each of us must face. He went to the grave and he didn't go there as a visitor. He went there as a corpse. His heart had quit beating. Breath quit flowing through his lungs. They wrapped him in burial cloths and they put him in a tomb and they rolled a stone in front of it. One day they'll take us to God's acre and they'll put us into the ground and they'll cover it up. And since that's going to happen to most of us until the Lord returns, we need somebody who knows the way out. And Jesus Christ is that one. He will not leave you unattended. When that day comes, he will be there to meet you. And you will know his peace. And you will know eternal joy. And he will care for you on that day. You will not face it alone. He will be there to be with you. Let that peace that only God can bring into your heart fill your joy in this life. Share the hope that is within you with everyone that you are able to. Then look forward to the day that he has prepared for you in heaven and the glory of what he has for you there. Let us pray. Most precious Lord, we thank you for what you have in store for us, both in this world and in the next. We can look at our life and we can see your faithfulness time and again, that you have blessed us and comforted us, that you've come to us in our hour of need and how faithful you are. And with that in mind, we have no doubt that your promises of eternal life with you and joy in heaven will be ours as well. May we share that with a world that so needs to hear it, a world that often seems is void of hope. But you are our hope, Lord, and we trust in you till we see you face to face. And what we have believed then, we will know to be true. This we pray in your holy name. Amen.